Hello and welcome to Patriot Patch. My name is Lake Green and I'm happy to be back here today for yet another video as part of the full 1776 lecture series. In this video, we'll be discussing the retreat through New Jersey. It's a dark, harrowing time for the American army and probably the most uh, black period of the early American Revolution. If you want more information, please get David McCulloch's 1776. It's palatable, it's easy to read, it's engaging, it tells you everything you need to know about this campaign from front to back. I can't recommend it enough. Mr. McCulloch passed away just in August of this year. He's a master historian of the American Revolution. Highly recommend the work. But just to give you an idea of how decimated the American army has been, Washington started with 20,000 men in August. It's now only about three months later in the end of November, and he's down to some 5,500 men under his personal command. 5,500. Another 5,500 in North Castle, New York, under the command of Charles Lee, that he's calling to, to join in on his march south through New Jersey, his second-in-command, Charles Lee. Lee is arrogant. Lee will actually sabotage him and, and act, act in insubordination and slow his, his march down intentionally, hoping that the British can destroy Washington and that his, his group of men will be the last ones left in the field. But Washington will have the last, uh, last laugh because Lee will be the product of his own demise, and he'll be captured at the end of this retreat. I want to reinstill. It's now November, late November, almost December. The surviving American troops that marched through New Jersey are still in their summer clothes. They're in rags. They're cut up. They're in the same clothes they've been wearing since August. They're not equipped to deal with the cold. They have no food, they have no shoes, most of them, and they're marching in tattered rags through the dirt roads through New Jersey. And to make matters worse, it's not snowing just yet, it will be in a few short weeks, but there's freezing rain pouring down on top of these men. These men are literally freezing to death with no shoes, marching on mud roads. Mud roads. I just can't imagine... The bravery and the courage that somebody would have to have within them to continue on. There's no tents. There's no blankets. They've Remember, they've abandoned all their supplies at Fort Washington and Fort Lee. The American Army has no supplies. And yet these brave souls continue to march south through New Jersey. You know, what type of man did you have to be to put yourself through that and still remain in the ranks fighting for your country? I, I just can't. I can't. Imagine it. I can't. Before we get into any further details, I want to show you a clip from a great movie. I watch this movie every Christmas. It's called The Crossing. And I just want to put a clip here on the screen for you just to give you a short little idea of how freezing cold and how beleaguered and how just demoralized these American men were on the retreat. wasn't that harrowing and that is that's a nice depiction that's a modern Hollywood depiction there is no way that the American army was, was even in that good shape by the time it marched south through New Jersey so eventually after Fort Lee Falls Washington and his men barely escape entrapment over 3,200 men were nearly captured by the British several hundred actually were and the army abandoned food supplies ammunition blankets tents they are now marching southward through New Jersey in winter weather with nothing Washington writes eagerly to Charles Lee and his 5,500 men that are still encamped in North Castle, New York, to join him in his march south. Lee, being insubordinate, purposely slows his march. Meanwhile, the American army is disintegrating. On December 1st, thousands of men's enlistments will expire. And on January 1st, when the new year turns to the calendar in 1777, every last American soldier left in the ranks will be free to go home. The American army will literally be disintegrating. The army will cease to exist in less than a month. The British are triumphant. On the retreat south after Washington abandons Fort Lee without a fight, 
he retreats five miles southward towards Hackensack and the Passaic River. After he gets his men across the Passaic River, he marches another 20 miles south to Newark, New Jersey. The city we know today of Newark is not the city that everybody knows today. It's a small little port town. It's very small. It's settled by mostly men from New England, ex-Puritans. And the Americans march there, stay there for a very short amount of time, and continue their retreat southward. All the while, as they march south through New Jersey... 10,000 men under the command of Charles Cornwallis are right on their tail. So after Newark, they go down to Woodbridge and Elizabeth and then cut across the middle of the state to New Brunswick. On December 1st, the enlistments of 2,000 of his troops from Maryland and New Jersey expire. And literally, in just a day, all of these men pack up and march and just and just leave. They go home. Washington now has only 3,000 troops left at his disposal. Charles Lee has some 5,500 north of him, but Washington has only 3,000 troops, and he's being pursued by only a fraction of the 30,000-man strung British and Hessian army of 10,000 troops under Cornwallis. Washington always rides to the rear of his army. Throughout the entire retreat, he's riding at the rear. And a young lieutenant from Virginia, who was then 18 years old, with the name of, uh, never heard of him before, James Monroe, future president of the United States, actually is marching south with Washington at 18 years old, fighting for his country, and he writes this account of him. I saw him at the head of a small band, or rather in its rear, for he was always near the enemy, and his countenance and matter made an impression on me which I can never efface. A deportment so firm, so dignified, but yet so modest and composed, I have never seen in any other person. So Washington putting himself in the most extreme dangerous position he's the last man on his line of retreat he's riding at the rear of his army to keep his men moving forward lord rawdon writes um to london the fact is their army is broken all to pieces and the spirit of their leaders and their betters are broken i think one may venture to pronounce that is well nigh over with them everybody is giving them up for dead everybody thinks it's over with even Lord Howe, and Lord Howe thinks that this that it's so done with and over that he has his brother issue a proclamation on November 30th. He orders another proclamation written and issued to the people of New Jersey. So as the American army treats southward through New Jersey, a proclamation is made by the advancing British army to all the citizens of New Jersey that anybody who comes to our camp signs an oath of loyalty and puts his hand on the Bible and says, I solemnly swear I defend king and country, will be completely absolved of any past offense. It's all for naught, though. As the British army marches south, what do they do? They burn, they plunder, they pillage, they steal food, they ransack farms. And remember, this is the 1700s. There's no grocery stores. So these people that are living on farms out in New Jersey, they're keeping their food in the barn, and that's the food they have to survive off of the entire winter. Other than that, they can't eat. And so now men that may have been afraid of the British, don't think the Americans can win, are driven to extremes because now they don't have any food for their families. And this actually helped the Americans get people to enlist in New Jersey militia in this dark time. A lot of these men that wouldn't fight otherwise pick up their muskets and join the Americans. Not a substantial amount, but a good amount of them. So the British are ransacking the New Jersey countryside. Washington retreats southward from Elizabeth West towards New Brunswick, a young Alexander Hamilton in command of an artillery battery in the Continental Army, positions his artillery outside of the town of New Brunswick along the Raritan River, and from a high position, uses the remaining ammunition he has to fire back at the advancing British. His actions here will actually buy the Americans crucial time, allows the Americans to retreat a couple miles up the road, and they hastily beat across 30 miles of open plains from New Brunswick to Trenton, and once they get to Trenton, it's December 2nd, and Washington orders Colonel John Glover, his marblehead fisherman who has saved his army twice already, to once again pull off the impossible. He orders him to go up to the Durham Ironworks, pick up a whole bunch of long, flat-bottomed boats that they use to transport iron ore and coal from Pennsylvania across New Jersey and vice versa, round these boats up, seize them, and then use them to 
uh, evacuate the Americans across the Delaware River. But here's the key detail that I'm going to leave you with before we conclude this harrowing retreat. Washington's army is saved once again by incompetence of the British. But yet Cornwallis, after taking New Brunswick, orders his army to halt. And he doesn't move them for six days. Washington's men marched 30 miles up the road to Trenton. And they're stuck there till December 8th. They can't retreat across the river till December 8th. If Cornwallis would have just kept up his march, he would have cornered them at Trenton, forced them to fight there, and they would have been destroyed more than likely. They're outnumbered 3,000 to 10,000 up front, head to head. He doesn't. He stays at New Brunswick. American army has marched 80 miles in just two weeks. They've retreated through New Jersey. They're now encamped on the riverbanks of Pennsylvania. And it's not looking good. Thanks so much for watching. Rate, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Patriot Pads. I'm Lake Green.